The World as Will and Representation WWR, German, Die Welt als Will und Vorstellung, WWV, is the central work of the German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer. The first edition was published in 1818-1819, the second expanded edition in 1844, and the third expanded edition in 1859. In 1948, an abridged version was edited by Thomas Mann. Topic: English translations. In the English language, this work is known under three different titles. Although English publications about Schopenhauer played a role in the recognition of his fame as a philosopher in later life 1851 until his death in 1860 and a three-volume translation by R. B. Haldane and J. Kemp, titled The World as Will and Idea, appeared already in 1883-1886, the first English translation of the expanded edition of this work under this title The World as Will and Representation appeared by E. F. J. Payne who also translated several other works of Schopenhauer as late as in 1958 paperback editions in 1966 and 1969. A later English translation by Richard E. Aquila in collaboration with David Karras is titled The World as Will and Presentation 2008. Present-day translator Richard Aquila argues that the reader will not grasp the details of the philosophy of Schopenhauer properly without this new title, The World as Will and Presentation. According to him, idea, representation, and presentation are all acceptable renderings of the word Vorstellung, but it is the notion of a performance or a theatrical presentation that is key in his interpretation. The world that we perceive as a presentation of objects in the theater of our own mind, the observers, the subject. Each craft the show with their own stage managers, stagehands, sets, lighting, code of dress, pay scale, etc. The other aspect of the world, the will, or thing in itself, which is not perceivable as a presentation, exists outside time, space, and causality. Aquila claims to make these distinctions as linguistically precise as possible. Topic. Relationship to earlier philosophical work The main body of the work states at the beginning that it assumes prior knowledge of Immanuel Kant's theories, and Schopenhauer is regarded by some as remaining more faithful to Kant's metaphysical system of transcendental idealism than any of the other later German idealists. However, the book contains an appendix entitled critique of the Kantian philosophy, in which Schopenhauer rejects most of Kant's ethics and significant parts of his epistemology and aesthetics. Schopenhauer demands that the introduction be read before the book itself, although it is not fully contained in this book but appeared earlier under the title On the Fourfold Root of the Principle of Sufficient Reason. He also states in his introduction that the reader will be at his best prepared to understand his theories if he has lingered in the school of Plato or he is already familiar with Indian philosophy. Schopenhauer believed that Kant had ignored inner experience, as intuited through the will, which was the most important form of experience. Schopenhauer saw the human will as our one window to the world behind the representation, the Kantian thing in itself. He believed, therefore, that we could gain knowledge about the thing in itself, something Kant said was impossible, since the rest of the relationship between representation and thing in itself could be understood by analogy to the relationship between human will and human body. According to Schopenhauer, the entire world is the representation of a single will, of which our individual wills are phenomena. In this way, Schopenhauer's metaphysics go beyond the limits that Kant had set, but do not go so far as the rationalist system builders who preceded Kant. 
Other important differences are Schopenhauer's rejection of 11 of Kant's 12 categories, arguing that only causality was important. Matter and causality were both seen as a union of time and space and thus being equal to each other. Schopenhauer frequently acknowledges drawing on Plato in the development of his theories and, particularly in the context of aesthetics, speaks of the Platonic forms as existing on an intermediate ontological level between the representation and the will. Topic. Development of the work The development of Schopenhauer's ideas took place very early in his career 1814 and culminated in the publication of the first volume of Will and Representation in 1819. This first volume consisted of four books, covering his epistemology, ontology, aesthetics and ethics, in order. Much later in his life, in 1844, Schopenhauer published a second edition in two volumes, the first a virtual reprint of the original, and the second a new work consisting of clarifications to and additional reflections on the first. His views had not changed substantially. His belated fame after 1851 stimulated renewed interest in his seminal work, and led to a third and final edition with 136 more pages in 1859, one year before his death. In the preface to the latter, Schopenhauer noted, If I also have at last arrived, and have the satisfaction at the end of my life of seeing the beginning of my influence, it is with the hope that, according to an old rule, it will last longer in proportion to the lateness of its beginning. Topic. Will Schopenhauer used the word will as a human's most familiar designation for the concept that can also be signified by other words such as desire, striving, wanting, effort, and urging. Schopenhauer's philosophy holds that all nature, including man, is the expression of an insatiable will to life. It is through the will that mankind finds all their suffering. Desire for more is what causes this suffering. He argues that only aesthetic pleasure creates momentary escape from the will. The concept of desire has strong parallels in Buddhist thought. Buddhism identifies the individual's pervasive sense of dissatisfaction as driving craving, roughly similar to what Schopenhauer would call the will to life. Both assert that remedies for this condition include contemplative activities. Topic. Epistemology Book One. As mentioned above, Schopenhauer's notion of the will comes from the Kantian thing in itself, which Kant believed to be the fundamental reality behind the representation that provided the matter of perception, but lacked form. Kant believed that space, time, causation, and many other similar phenomena belonged properly to the form imposed on the world by the human mind in order to create the representation, and these factors were absent from the thing in itself. Schopenhauer pointed out that anything outside of time and space could not be differentiated, so the thing in itself must be one and all things that exist, including human beings, must be part of this fundamental unity. Our inner experience must be a manifestation of the noumenal realm and the will as the inner kernel of every being. All knowledge gained of objects is seen as self-referential, as we recognize the same will in other things as is inside us. Topic. Ontology Book 2 In Book 2, electricity and gravity are described as fundamental forces of the will. Knowledge is something that was invented to serve the will and is present in both human and non-human animals. It is subordinate to the demands of the will for all animals and most humans. 
The fundamental nature of the universe and everything in it is seen as this will. Schopenhauer presents a pessimistic picture on which unfulfilled desires are painful, and pleasure is merely the sensation experienced at the instant one such pain is removed. However, most desires are never fulfilled, and those that are fulfilled are instantly replaced by more unfulfilled ones. Topic. Aesthetics Book 3 Like many other aesthetic theories, Schopenhauer's centers on the concept of genius. Genius, according to Schopenhauer, is possessed by all people in varying degrees and consists of the capacity for aesthetic experience. An aesthetic experience occurs when an individual perceives an object and understands by it not the individual object itself, but the platonic form of the object. The individual is then able to lose himself in the object of contemplation and, for a brief moment, escape the cycle of unfulfilled desire by becoming the pure subject of will less knowing. Those who have a high degree of genius can be taught to communicate these aesthetic experiences to others, and objects that communicate these experiences are works of art. Based on this theory, Schopenhauer viewed Dutch still life as the best type of painting, because it was able to help viewers see beauty in ordinary, everyday objects. However, he sharply criticized depictions of nude women and prepared food, as these stimulate desire and thus hinder the viewer from the aesthetic experience and becoming the pure subject of will less knowing. Music also occupies a privileged place in Schopenhauer's aesthetics, as he believed it to have a special relationship to the will. Where other forms of art are imitations of things perceived in the world, music is a direct expression and articulation of the will. Topic. Ethics Book 4 Schopenhauer claims in this book to set forth a purely descriptive account of human ethical behavior, in which he identifies two types of behavior, the affirmation and denial of the will. According to Schopenhauer, the will, the great will that is the thing in itself, not the individual wills of humans and animals, which are phenomena of the will, conflicts with itself through the egoism that every human and animal is endowed with. Compassion arises from a transcendence of this egoism, the penetration of the illusory perception of individuality, so that one can empathize with the suffering of another and can serve as a clue to the possibility of going beyond desire and the will. Schopenhauer categorically denies the existence of the freedom of the will in the conventional sense, and only adumbrates how the will can be released or negated, but is not subject to change, and serves as the root of the chain of causal determinism. His praise for asceticism led him to think highly of Buddhism and Vedanta Hinduism, as well as some monastic orders and ascetic practices found in Catholicism. He expressed contempt for Protestantism, Judaism, and Islam, which he saw as optimistic, devoid of metaphysics and cruel to non-human animals. According to Schopenhauer, the deep truth of the matter is that in cases of the over-affirmation of the will, that is, cases where one individual exerts his will not only for its own fulfillment but for the improper domination of others, he is unaware that he is really identical with the person he is harming, so that the will in fact constantly harms itself, and justice is done in the moment in which the crime is committed, since the same metaphysical individual is both the perpetrator and the victim. Schopenhauer discusses suicide at length, noting that it does not actually destroy the will or any part of it in any substantial way, since death is merely the end of one particular phenomenon of the will, which is subsequently rearranged. By asceticism, the ultimate denial of the will, one can slowly weaken the individual will in a way that is far more significant than violent suicide, which is, in fact, in some sense an affirmation of the will. 
According to Schopenhauer, denial of the will to live is the way to salvation from suffering. Schopenhauer tells us that when the will is denied, the sage becomes nothing, without actually dying. When willing disappears, both the willer and the world become nothing. T O one who has achieved the will-less state, it is the world of the willer that has been disclosed as nothing. Its hold over us, its seeming reality, has been abolished so that it now stands before us as nothing but a bad dream from which we are, thankfully, awaking. As Schopenhauer wrote, to those in whom the will has turned and denied itself, this very real world of ours, with all its suns and milky ways, is, nothing. Topic. Criticism of the Kantian philosophy appendix At the end of Book 4, Schopenhauer appended a thorough discussion of the merits and faults of Kant's philosophy. Schopenhauer's critique of the Kantian philosophy asserted that Kant's greatest error was the failure to distinguish between perceptual, intuitive knowledge, or insight and conceptual, discursive knowledge, or investigative thinking. One of Kant's greatest contributions, according to Schopenhauer, was the distinction of the phenomenon from the thing in itself. Topic. Volume 2 The second volume consisted of several essays expanding topics covered in the first. Most important are his reflections on death and his theory on sexuality, which saw it as a manifestation of the whole while making sure that it will live on and depriving humans of their reason and sanity in their longing for their loved ones. Less successful is his theory of genetics, he argued that humans inherit their will, and thus their character, from their fathers, but their intellect from their mothers and he provides examples from biographies of great figures to illustrate this theory. The second volume also contains attacks on contemporary philosophers such as Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel. The contents of volume 2 are as follows. Topic. Influence The first decades after its publication The World as Will and Representation was met with near silence. Exceptions were Goethe and Jean-Paul. Goethe immediately started to read the magnum opus of Schopenhauer when it arrived and read it with an eagerness as she Ottilia von Goethe had never before seen in him. Goethe told his daughter-in-law that he had now pleasure for an entire year, because he would read it completely, contrary to his custom of sampling pages to his liking. The influence of Schopenhauer can be read in Gesprash mit Goethe and Erwarte. Orfish. In the years where the work was largely ignored, Jean-Paul praised it as a work of philosophical genius, bold, universal, full of penetration and profoundness, but of a depth often hopeless and bottomless, akin to that melancholy lake in Norway, in whose deep water, beneath the steep rock walls, one never sees the sun, but only stars reflected, on which Schopenhauer commented, in my opinion the praise of one man of genius fully makes good the neglect of a thoughtless multitude, this neglect came to an end in the last years of his life. Schopenhauer would become the most influential philosopher in Germany until World War I especially artists were attracted to the work. No philosopher had given so much importance to art, one-fourth of the world as will and representation as concerned with aesthetics. To be mentioned are Wagner, influence of Schopenhauer on Tristan und Isolde, Schoenberg, Mahler, who cites the world as will and representation as the most profound writing on music he had ever encountered, Thomas Mann, Hermann Hesse, Jorge Luis Borges, Tolstoy, D. H. Lawrence and Samuel Beckett.
The philosophers Friedrich Nietzsche and Philip Mainlander both described the discovery of the world as will and representation as a revelation. Nietzsche commented, I belong to those readers of Schopenhauer who know perfectly well, after they have turned the first page, that they will read all the others, and listen to every word that he has spoken. Charles Darwin quoted the world as will and representation in The Descent of Man. Some read ideas in it that can be found in the theory of evolution, for example, that sexual instinct is a tool of nature to ensure the quality of the offspring and that intellect is a mere means to preserve life. Schopenhauer argued in favor of transformism by pointing to one of the most important and familiar evidences of the truth of the theory of descent, the homologies in the inner structure of all the vertebrates. Schopenhauer's ideas on the unconscious can be found in psychoanalysis and the works of Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung. Whereas Jung acknowledged Schopenhauer's influence, Freud denied to have read Schopenhauer until late in life, a claim which is considered to be doubtful. Schopenhauer's discussions of language and ethics were a major influence on Ludwig Wittgenstein, Schopenhauer's views on the independence of spatially separated systems, the Principium Individuationis, influenced Einstein, who called him a genius. Schrödinger put the Schopenhauerian label on a folder of papers in his files collection of thoughts on the physical Principium Individuationis. <laughs> <laughs> 